everyone and good morning. I hope everyone had a great weekend. Uh, we have another exciting program ahead of us today. By the way, I hope you've seen the new copy of the new edition of the Delaware Times. We are featuring volunteers uh, who are engaged in activities in the community, what organizations they're engaged in, and a couple of events coming up. March 18th is the Blue Gold Basketball Game where the All-Star High School seniors get to play in a, a great, exciting uh, uh, game of basketball. The boys and girls play separately. That's at the Dover High School, which is a grand new campus. If you haven't been there, try it out. Um, and that's on March 18th. And uh, then on March 25th, I believe it is, we have the Easter Seals Volleyball Tournament. And there's an article written by a young woman who is a client at Easter Seals. And she has raised uh, in the year she's been supporting the volleyball tournament nearly $100,000. And uh, I hope that you will help her reach her goal. Uh, we will follow up with her and find out how she does. Uh, so there are two events. Uh, the uh, Blue Gold Basketball is not only helping seniors with scholarships, but it also is supporting coaches versus cancer this year. They're raising money for that nonprofit. Um, we have some trainings coming up this week, uh, Wednesday night at the Colonial Region in Newcastle County at People's Plaza, and Thursday at uh, Dave Wilson's auction at the Red Barn um, to the right of his building, auction building. Uh, we're having a uh, political director from the Republican National Committee come in and train on how to push, chase, and cure absentee and mail-in ballots. School board elections are coming up. Uh, absentee voting is allowed. It's the old rules for school board. Uh, you have to either vote in person or have a reason that you cannot be at the polls. But for those Republicans who cannot be at the polls, we want to encourage everyone to reach out, locate them, find them, get them to request a ballot, get them to complete that ballot and get that ballot in and counted. It's critically important that we're fully engaged uh, on the school board election. And we still have a few openings for candidates. So if you know anyone who might be interested in being a candidate or you know anyone who, uh, or if you yourself are interested, please let us know, let your region chair know so that we can follow up with you. <clears throat> So joining us this morning is Ruth Briggs King. Good morning, uh, Representative. How are you this morning? I'm well, thank you. Good, good. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we uh, always ask a little bit of background information. So tell us what you do besides being a legislator in life and how long, what brought you to the world of politics? Uh, well, I've had a, a very, I guess, unique background and experience. And uh, what I'm doing today is um, is, is enjoying being a wife and a mother and grandmother to, to some little ones there. But I also do consulting on the side. Once I retired from that realm full time, I do human resource and strategic planning for businesses and not for profits. We've gotten a lot of interest in that. Um, my business partner, Workforce Solutions, and I. Um, my getting involved in politics, I think, started being born into a Republican family <laughs> during the Eisenhower administration. And so my dad was always engaged, my grandfather as well. And in fact, I think in early 60s, my, my father had saw office as a sheriff. It was not a good year for Republicans that year. But some of my early recollections are when Bill Roth ran the first time and walking Ludwig for him, got, sent me out of the house and kept me busy. Um, but I stayed involved in, in politics most of my life. And through different jobs, I got involved in a lot of different advocacy groups and at one time I was actually, um, you know, very engaged in, I won't call it lobbying, but advocating for industry, particularly that related to housing and realtors. So I was in and out of leg hall a lot, saw some people there and thought, well, gee, I could do this. And, um, and took some classes at that time. There was a special women's program, Women in Excellence in Public Series that the Republicans won. I got in that program. And from there, um, went to a couple of women's events at RNC and was encouraged to go to Yale Candidacy School. And just finished that school at about the same time um, that Senator Thurman Adams uh, uh, died suddenly and unexpectedly, which caused a series of events, um, a special election in which my representative, Joe Booth, was elected to the Senate. 
which meant a vacancy in the house and having just, I was ready. I was ready to run. They tell getting ready to run. I was ready to run. And, um, and so that was a special election. You had four weeks to get everything together and win in the middle of the summer in 2009. And we did it. Our, our Republican engine was so strong that summer that we, we had the momentum to get our, the first Senate to take that Senate seat that had been held for over 20 years by a Democrat to move that over to the Republican side and then to keep that House seat. It was a very strong effort statewide, statewide effort. And it was the beginning of what has been a Republican dominated county for the most part. Correct. And very, very so, correct. Although we all miss Senator Thurman Adams because he always voted with us. <laughs> yes, he was very conservative. Because he was the leadership in the Senate, he actually got a lot of good done for us and, uh, and our po principles and policies. So it used to be we had some conservative Democrats in the legislature. I, I can recall a conversation one time we were in a room and, and, um, and Thurman was saying that a bill had gone in his drawer and that is where it was staying. And Representative George Carey at the time says, I, I like putting things in that drawer. <laughs> you know, yeah. keep, I like you keeping things in your drawer. And that just shows <laughs> that they had working on different issues together. It was a funny moment. He would ask me at the end of the session when I was attorney general, getting on the last week of the session, write the three things you really want on the back of your business card and give it to me. And he put it in his pocket. He and Tom Sharp both. And mm -hmm. I would, I would inv invariably get the three things I wanted. It would be, they were great. Um, back in the day, right? Right. Now today, the composition of the Democrat um, majority is very different. Um, we have about one half exactly is progressive of that caucus. One half is what used to look liberal now looks moderate. <laughs> um, and so it's a, it's a very different uh, Democrat caucus than existed for decades in the General Assembly. I, I would agree. And as I said, that as that caucus grows and gets larger in size <coughs> and, and more um, diverse, and like you said, between moderate and progressives, um, you can see the, um, you know, how they, they break off into different groups and there's often their own disagreement. They'll take much longer to come to consensus in caucus than we do. We're often, we're frequently waiting for them to finish whatever is going on inside their, their healthy debate because they'll say they don't argue, but they'll have a healthy debate that will go on for hours. Right, yeah. I don't envy uh, the speaker <laughs> at this point. Um, now, uh, you have been in the General Assembly then for a few years. Um, you have served uh, your district um, where did with redistricting, did your district change? My, my district has changed significantly three times. The first time I was elected and went from Georgetown all the way down into Lewis, into Lewis proper. And then, of course, they told me they would, when I won that the second time very strongly, they weren't going to let me keep um, what was a primary Democrat hold. So they redistrict and gave me all the way to Long Neck and Oak Orchard, which had issues distinct to its own to manufactured housing. It had been neglected, seriously neglected in terms of infrastructure and some other stuff. And so, you know, over the years, worked a relationship, built that area up. You know, when I turned it over to uh, to Rep Hilvosky, I said, your roads are all in good or better condition. You know, your communities have been taken care of. We've done a lot of good things in that area. And that area has grown, no doubt about it, getting a new district. And so right. now my my district now is almost back to sort of a little bit of its initial footprint, um, except I, I, I go down Beaver Dam Road, which is also full of expansion and growth. Um, but it's, it's more of an image of when I first started. Right. Yeah. I think people should take note of the way that the representative references her district and how she took responsibility for uh, and pride in um, the work that she did to improve the district. I think that's how most of our representatives feel. And I think you can hear um, the, uh, the way that people matter to uh, Representative King, uh, Briggs King, uh, in the way that she talks about the work she did in uh, the Long Neck area, for instance. So great, uh, great to hear how engaged and committed you are. Um, so you serve on the Joint Finance Committee and in the last few weeks, we've heard that the Joint Finance Committee is meeting. Who, what agencies have you heard from? What kinds of uh, requests are you seeing? 
Uh, how's it going with JFC? Joint well, Biden? it's 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 a high spend year. That's for sure. You know, this is the largest uh, budget increase, single increase there's ever been. It's, it's a proposed seven point nine percent. And I can remember being on joint finance when Markel administration, he was trying to keep it, you know, to under 5%. And it's just grown every, every year. And it's been easy to say, well, there was a lot of COVID and a lot of other money coming in. That money is not going to stay. Um, so we have heard from every agency except Denrec, which we hear from tomorrow. And then the whole rest of the week is DH, uh, Delaware <laughs> um, Health and Human Services, which takes up a huge part. Education. You can figure is one third of the budget and DHSS is one third. And then everything else in the state is combined into that other, you know, those other, whether that be attorney general, treasure, own land, um, you know, they're all in part of that other one third of the budget. So when you look at that, you think these are, these are some really big spends, um, you know, uh, you know, a billion and a, and a half for education that goes up every year because we were increasing students every year. And so part of the part of the money in education is the money to spend per student or per unit count. There's two separate things there. Right. Um, but this year you can certainly see the impact of um, energy cost, of gas cost, because everybody that's come in has had to increase the fleet services. That's for the vehicles that they have in that agency has been an adjustment. The other thing in every area is adjusting to $15 an hour minimum wage for state. And then where the state is competing to get workers and keep workers. And, you know, we've always heard the challenges they have in corrections, no different. The, um, the veterans home, which has one wing that's not occupied because they can't get nurses and nursing assistants, that impacts our veterans that need senior care. Um, right, right down the line. But I did make the comment that the state can come in and can increase and can spend money in marketing and recruiting. We have to be careful because small business may not have those deep pockets and it might be unfair to them or to not-for-profits that we're, um, we're contracting. The state contracts some not-for-profit -pro providers you know, to do home care and do these things and they're not able to pay the same wages because their contract is less than what the state's paying their workers. So it's an uneven field. And um, I, I, we're going to look at how we can level that and make that a little more fair. That, that's one of my intentions anyway. Well, when the state doesn't have to be responsive to the market <clears throat> and is digging into the pockets of small business with gross receipts and other taxes, um, and when you hear that the federal government is going to hire 87,000 more IRS workers and mm -hmm. Forbes and other magazines uh, or other outlets have published that what they're going after are waiters and waitresses, small business people that they think are cheating. And, uh, you know, and yet the Democrats swear they're for the little guy. Give me a break. Right. <laughs> and, and there's no, we talk about, and many of my colleagues, we're introducing pieces of legislation to try and ease the credit bird, particularly doing these inflationary times. And, you know, all the experts want to argue if we're going into a recession this year, but people don't need you to tell them what's going on. They know when they go to get gasoline. I mean, gas prices have fluctuated 10 cents a gallon in the last week alone. They come up and then they come down and then they're right back up again um, when they're paying for their energy cost, especially during winter, going to the grocery store, and, you know, they're saying this isn't an 8% increase. I'm paying how much for a dozen eggs? When, and I used to pay $1.19. I mean, this is real. This is real table economics like Reagan talked about. I got some bacon on sale for almost $10 this week. Eight, nine, I think, or something. Um, so uh, let's talk about education. You've commented on that. Um, one of the big issues that I think we've heard about is a lot of absenteeism and a shortage of instructors or um, uh, substitutes. How is state policy affecting the teacher shortage and uh, absenteeism? And what are we going to do about student absenteeism? Right. And it's a, it's a dual problem. And we had the secretary of education in last week. And, you know, there's an increase. The governor in his proposed budget was to increase classroom teacher salary. 9%. And hearing a lot from different educators, 
Um, the issue isn't so much, a salary is an issue, yes, because we're competing with other states to recruit and retain educators. Um, Delaware had, over the last, I'm going to say, eight years, really increased the standards uh, certification and the whole process. And so if the student's looking to come to Delaware and going to have to go take another test or do other stuff or stay where they are, or, you know, and plus the salary's higher, that's one reason they're not coming. The second thing for many of our teachers and others is finding housing. They cannot finding how they can't find an apartment or they can't find one they can afford. And so they'll look elsewhere, particularly in Sussex County, it's become a real problem for, um, you know, for workforce housing. And then we get back into the classroom. The issue besides money is really climate in the classroom. When a teacher feels they, they don't have the ability to effectively discipline a child um, when there's issues or when a teacher has maybe 20 plus students and several of those have special needs and they don't have an aide or somebody to help them, um, it's it's challenging. And I had one of them say the other day, it is so stressful because I don't feel, A, I don't feel I'm able to do what I should be doing because I'm torn between meeting the needs of somebody with a special needs or 15 of the other students in the classroom. Um, and so, or dealing with some other discipline related kind of issues. Um, forced to take on so many issues that aren't really focused on education, but that are, you know, um, community oriented. And well, so mandates a lot of things for teachers that they have to be trained on and cover. It doesn't make them experts. Uh, they're, they're not going to be effective necessarily. You know, you're allaying some kind of uh, uh, concern maybe for the state DOE in terms of liability, but you're not really advancing classroom learning. And one of the things that the classroom is be about is learning. And what we're finding is that we're not getting a return on our money in that regard, are we? We're, we're really not. And if you look at some of the charter schools or even small private schools, what they can do with less, and because part of it is eliminating that bureaucracy and everything else that goes on. I mean, you can look in a school and say, um, when I went to school and, you know, back in the dark ages, we had a principal and an assistant principal. And today a school might have seven assistant principals. One of the reasons we're requiring them to be evaluated, to do these evaluations over and over. And um, and that's that's stressful to get those done as well as for that teacher. When I taught and I taught for a number of years, I could tell you the teachers that were effective and doing a great job. So students could tell you. I could also tell you the ones who weren't doing such a good job, they were tenured, they were there and, you know, um, and, and, that, and that was the situation. But, um, you know, looking at it, you talk about absenteeism, we have to talk about the loss of the teacher in the classroom. Once the paid family medical leave came into effect a few years ago, you can have a teacher that's out for almost the third of the school year and, and you can't get a good sub. You cannot find a substitute. Had people, at the time they were adopting that, there were um, uh, concerns raised by the Department of Education, were there not? Yes. Mm -hmm. And at, at the time, I can remember because I was bringing this up and, and Secretary Bunning, she said, Representative, you, you're correct. We're very concerned about the loss of instructional time, um, you know, 12 weeks, because a lot of educators, when I was teaching, they would they would try and have those those babies as additions to the family at the end of the school year. So and over the summer, so they could have that time with their newborn and be back in the classroom because there are many teachers, they went into teaching to teach, to impact that life. And they're feeling pulled in so many different directions. I made the point the other day that I've heard from teachers that at the beginning of the year, they have so many required things they have to do online or classes to sit through every year and they'd rather be getting ready for the new school year and getting plans and lesson plans and things ready and and the secretary agreed and said that they were they were going to look at that as well but I just think there's um a lot of things going on in the school that aren't necessarily education focused we're investing we believe in education we're investing um they said this summer how they're going to have summer programs again but last year those programs were poorly attended. I don't think they were on target specifically for students to get them. They lost a year and a half of education during COVID and the mindset changed, um, you know, and I think we still have a lot of absenteeism because if you get the sniffles, they want you out. They don't want you in. Um, and so I think that's still impacting, um, impacting the classroom and ed quality of education. And I know our universities are seeing it. 
you're having students come in that have missed a year, year and a half of, of their other secondary studies. So um, we talked about the budget a little bit. <coughs> <coughs> Let's talk about the sources of revenue. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a minute. So um, last week we Find it. Last week was very interesting because the Department of State came in. Um, Jeffrey Bullock came in to give his presentation. Um, and he talked about, he said, I want you to remember that with this $5.4 billion budget, that almost half of that, two point, I believe my memory is correct, about $2.5 billion is generating revenue from corporate fees from businesses that incorporate in Delaware and from other things related to our corporate structure. So it's very important for Delaware and, and, and those elected officials as well as citizens to realize, you know, almost half of our budget is paid for by people outside of Delaware, by these corporations that incorporate here, um, by, by a sheet, the way we do that, and a few other things. So it's important that we recognize the value of our court of chancery because that court is a distinctive, as you know, Judge, a distinctive business court, very high, um, very high stature in the judicial. And I did make the comment at the time last week, the judiciary also came in. I said, I want you to know how proud I am that Delaware does not elect our judges, that technically our judges are out of the political fray. And although we've always had a balance of, you know, um, of, of a Republican and Democrat, and I know that's sort of become questionable over the last few years, but I felt better, especially for a business court that I'm not elected to sit. But anyway, back to that, that part of the budget. So it's important to recognize a lot of our revenue. So the question was, the revenue has grown significantly during COVID. And the secretary, he said, the reason for that is the startup of new businesses. While we look at unemployment being, um, being low and, and people not coming back to work, Many people started their own business and are actually entrepreneurs. And we had an increase in corporate filings and new businesses because people were saying, I'll go in business for myself. My business might, where I worked might be cutting back or I may not like this. So there's a demand and the time is right. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And, and that's why we've had an increase in corporate revenue. Well, that's great. Um, let's hope that we use it well. Um, and uh, we don't spend it, uh, you know, we've had so much surplus in the past few years um, that we should have been able to give back some of the tax increases that we made when things were lean. <clears throat> if we continue to build into this budget, which has grown, as you mentioned, so exponentially this year, so much bigger this year, that's part of what we have to fund every year now uh, or cut services. Personally, I think the government does a lot that shouldn't be doing. We could cut uh, a lot I, of services. I, I agree. And I will say that, you know, we've tried, my colleagues and I, for several years now to introduce, we're bringing that realty transfer tax back down. When they were, when they were desperate for money and doing all yep. kinds of cuts and everything a few years ago, they increased that. And you know that that hits you can hit you on both sides. Um, you, you know, if you're a senior that's selling and that's been the equity and you need that for your senior years, you're paying that extra you know percent. If you're a new home buyer trying to make closing costs and getting to the table, when we have some of the highest you know housing in prices, um, yeah. that's money at the table. And so we know right now everybody can look at what's going on in the economy. Interest rates are going up. New housing starts are down. Existing house sales are down. That's that's a real indicator in our local economy. Yep. And uh, we uh, we took we promised that would be temporary. It was only while we were short of money. Well, four billion dollars later, in three yes. years, we haven't given back uh, those tax uh, increases to the public uh, to businesses. We didn't give businesses a break from gross receipts tax and other imp state imposed requirements during COVID when they weren't making any money. Um, yeah, gross receipts were down, but for businesses, every dollar that comes in, you pay a tax on it. And then when you, at the end of the year, if you have a profit, you pay more tax on it. It's, uh, we didn't give businesses a holiday to help them through. I thought that we really poorly managed the economy during the COVID pandemic. Um, and that we wasted and squandered a lot of money 
uh, without um, helping generate, which is our, our economy, which was a zero or below zero growth predicted even mm-hmm. before the pandemic. As you know, Ruth, when they did the studies, we had predicted a zero or below zero growth economy for the state of Delaware before the pandemic. Even then, they didn't take steps with that money to assure that our economy would be stronger over the long haul. I I just was very disappointed. And unfortunately, because we don't have the majority in either of the two houses, um, we need more Republicans because we can't stop the defendants, uh, the Democrats. <laughs> I, I'll treat them as defendants. I'll no, even if we even if we had more business-minded folks in general, because what you have, and, and we will frequently say this, is people that are used to signing the back of a check and not the front of a check. And it's very different when you're trying to make these decisions to to make payroll, to grow, to not grow, to order supplies. You know, somebody was saying the other day, you go in the grocery store, you don't have you don't have the merchandise you used to have. And part of that's not just distribution, it's that business can't afford to bring in and to have as many products as they did because everything that comes in, they're paying more for and have to raise their prices and people were, you know, they're not liking what they what they see. And that's part of the problem as well. Right, I, I was commenting with uh, the store manager of uh, one of the grocery stores the other day. And I said, you know, you've got everything at the front and you've got them too deep instead of like they used to be 12 deep and you know there'd be some missing from the front he says they very carefully are stocking to give the impression that they're fully capable of meeting your shopping needs Mm -hmm. Um, but they don't have a lot of backdrop they don't have a lot of backup uh, to what they're offering and it's been very evident Um, so you're right about that Uh, let me see here I uh I think uh, one of the other issues we wanted to talk about, you have a bill, a concept that would help consumers called the Right to Repair Act. And would you talk to us about that, please? So um, it's been part of a national effort that's been going on probably for about (laughs) five or six years. And it really started a lot in the agricultural community. Um, As you can imagine, when you buy a piece of equipment that's, you know, four or five hundred thousand and you're either in planting season or harvesting and it breaks down and it has all the technology in there that can tell you exactly what's wrong with it. And then you can't go ahead and fix it on your own and you can't get that right. part. You have, have to wait for service. It's a little bit hard to you know, load up a combine and drive it 100 miles to get it serviced. And, right. and um, there have been promises by John Deere and some of the big manufacturers that, that they would address that. At the same time in Massachusetts, probably about 10 years ago, They had the same problem with the auto industry where you couldn't get parts once you own your, you couldn't get parts to fix it or reputable repair services couldn't get parts they needed. Um, And then we add in these little things called technology. So um, as an example, last week, Tuesday morning, all of a sudden my phone was dead. I took it off the charger, nothing. I couldn't do messages. I couldn't do phone calls. I couldn't check my calendar. Um, Luckily I have it backed up on another device But what it resulted in was making an appointment and driving up to the Apple store in Christiana to get it fixed that day. Um, Apple has has eased up a little bit. They were one of the companies, if you used to crack your screen, you you could take it to somebody to maybe try and fix it, but if they didn't put it in right or different things. So it was the ability to get the the equipment, the tools needed to open it to fix it, um, as well as the technology, because if you go up to the Apple store, they're going to plug it in and do diagnostics and everything else on it. And so the ability is for all these kind of small electronics, small electronics, we could even get more complicated and say, if you remember at the beginning of COVID, when they were having a problem with not enough ventilators or the ventilators needed to be whatever, <laughs> um, only the one company could fix their own equipment. You could have been a biomedical tech engineer with advanced training that you could do that, but they wouldn't give you the ability to do that. Um, We've had the Department of Defense talk about (laughs) technology being down in the field and needing to work certain items or satellites or whatever, and the manufacturer not giving them the ability to do that. There was a government study two years ago called Nix the Fix, and it was uh, all kinds of different corporates and equipment talking about the need to being able to repair the right to repair if i pay for this and i own it i should be able to go to a qualified repair person so let's say you're a small business you've worked in 
you've worked in fixing, maybe you worked on in the marine industry and you work for Mercury engines all your life. You want to start your own business. Mercury says, nope, if you're not affiliated with our dealership, we're not going to give you the parts. We're not going to give you the, the schematics, the technology to fix this. So what this bill does is it remedies that. It says, if you purchase the equipment, you have the right to take it to somebody to get it fixed. And what it's saying, if I want to be a repair person and have a relationship that that company, that, that maker can, can make an agreement with me and then can I can buy the goods to repair them at the same, at a reasonable cost um, that, that they would do with their own repair shops. Um, we know there's not, you can try and get a repair on something and you might wait weeks. That's part of it. This will speed up that process, encourage small business. Um, the other thing it will do is it will reduce this notion of planned obsolescence. Um, many years ago, you buy a cell phone and they would keep putting out updates and updates and updates till all of a sudden your phone won't hold a charge and it's forcing you to buy a new phone. So there's some things that go on. There's been many people that have come out to support the bill, the, um, the medical society, Plastic Free Delaware, a lot of environmental groups, because it's a bipartisan effort. There's a lot of good things that will stop this throwaway notion that we can fix it. Why don't we fix it? Well, because we can't get parts or because there's nobody that can repair it. Well, this will help alleviate some of those challenges that we face. I, I have a phone with Verizon and I bought maintenance insurance on it through a company called uh, Assurian. It's affiliated with them. They just opened an Assurian store in Dover next to Hobby Lobby uh, across from Dell State that um, does um, do repairs and uh, are authorized, I guess, um, because they had access to all my information about the insurance that I had through Verizon, as well as offered uh, options for cleaning and repairing and doing all kinds of work with my devices. So my son's phone, <laughs> you know how kids <clears throat> So, excuse me. So there are apparently uh, some options becoming available short of going all the way from Sussex to Wilmington, I'm hoping. And, and, and I suspect that Ashurian already made, it made an agreement with Apple. And I know that last year, um, actually it was 21, I think Biden signed an executive order um, wanting to, to look at the right to repair. And I also know that last year in 22, John Deere signed an agreement, an MOU with the National Farm Bureau Farmers Association. And so that's why that language was taken out of my bill, because if you introduce language in any individual state, they would uh, it would um, they would null and void their, their understanding to do that. So that's why I removed it. it's like, OK, um, industry and Apple did something last year as well now saying where they're going to do that. So these major companies are signaling coming around. 26, 26 states have very similar legislation. New York passed something last year. Uh, one of the most liberal states, I believe it was Washington or Oregon, did the same. Um, so they're, they know that um, there's bipartisan support and they're trying to handle this without it being mandated. Well, and, and to be honest with you, it's a pro-consumer concept. Mm -hmm. It helps the consumer, um, the end user. Um, and today, uh, fixing is a better alternative to purchasing new for two reasons. As you say, the extreme left is on board because there's not the throwaway mentality and the <clears throat> rights on board because it's personal liberty and decision-making and also inexpensive, less right. expensive, not right. necessarily inexpensive. And the, the thing that's built in this legislation too is that if the product is leased, you don't own it. So, um, and the other is there was this concern at first from some of the gaming industry, in other words, the Sonys and, and the Xboxes and stuff. And they're already copyright protected. You can't you know, certain information is, is copyright protected. So you can't, you're not going to tinker with that anyway. But if somebody's thing is broken, then they don't want to have to send it back um, or whatever. Or you're saying we can't fix it. Because a lot of times they'll say they can't fix it when they can. They just right. when you buy new. Right. Um, one more thing. Uh, we saw recently where um, the legislature passed a law regarding the use of unions in state contracts. Mm -hmm. And we 
heard from, especially the Latino and Hispanic community about their concerns um, about how that would affect small business, small contractors. And also I heard from some of the people and there aren't as many around now as there used to be, but the old Italian Masons and the guys that started the Cavaliers Country Club, right? Are these honorable Italian hardworking guys. And they were concerned uh, as well. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what the issues are there. Talk to us about what the issues are there and, and what organizations are there uh, out there that um, might be in a position to try and, and fight this. We're looking at some legal options, actually, I am, uh, but I'm not sure we'll have one. But I think I, I, the whole process, it was SB 35, which is what we call mini bond bill. And mini bond bill is usually where we take something that happened after June 30th between now where there's additional funding for capital improvements for major projects, state projects in Delaware. They put in this language in there that was should have been a separate piece of legislation because understand there's no committee meetings on mini bond bill. The public has no opportunity to engage or say anything. And as we just talked about the Delaware economy, the revenue grew because of new businesses, new small businesses. And there are many new small, particularly in Sussex County, probably more than other in the state, new Latino businesses, either in construction or in related to other trades, as well as the, um, the, uh, the Black Business Caucus. Both of those wrote letters signaling, you say you want to put this language in here that would give disadvantaged businesses um, an opportunity because obviously the state when it's been contracting must not have been considering those. You know, I find this over the last 20 years, one party has been in control and they're now telling me we've not been doing enough to give a small business or minority businesses opportunity. I find that ironic that we're gonna run this, push this piece of legislation through that they oppose. And one um, Latina advocate said, listen, if we want it to be a labor organization, we would be in one or we would offer it. We don't want that. We're a small business, our people, and they would they would have, they had about 200 people take off work and travel to legislative hall to demonstrate that they did not support this bill, how it would hurt them. They would not, they will not be able to bid because they do not have a local labor organization. So they're not unionized. And um, not only that they can't bid on it, you know, they can't look and show the community, this is the work that we're doing. We're capable of doing this kind of work. So it, it cuts them right out of the equation. Yet you say, we want to help you, but at the same time, you're eliminating their opportunity to bid unless they're an organized labor group. Um, right. I, uh, I made the comment that day it was so, for me, they, the week before they had us sit through training on civility, on humanity, on um, uh, implicit bias and these other things. And I stood up and I said, You're, you, you have me sit through these things. And yet today, this group has gathered here, 100, over 100, taken off work. They're not being paid. They're not getting a little gas card. They're not getting anything from organized labor. They're here on their own. And, and this is the first time they've had any interaction, many of them with government at all. And you're telling them they don't matter. You're sending a message to them. We're not even going to let you talk. We're not really listening to you. We know better than you do. And we tried. We had three or four different amendments trying to, you know, make it um, fair, at least try to semblance of it. And it was a pure party um, vote, pure politic vote. Mm -hmm. Very I mentioned that when I was AG, uh, uh, the Secretary of Labor under Governor Carper wanted to use one of these project labor agreements to build a violation of probation center, which is a small project. Usually these uh, arrangements are used on large construction projects that span multiple terms of office for any leadership in the state and uh, to assure continuity, like bridges, tunnels, you know, that kind of thing. And... Uh, and so I opposed it and uh, we were able to convince uh, go then Governor Carper that it was the wrong way to go. I'm very disappointed in this because it shuts down uh, a lot of those small businesses that sprung up during COVID and the personal, I mean, it's a great personal risk. If you've never had your own business, it's pretty frightening to know that, okay, I got to depend only on me. 
uh, I've done it, uh, but um, it's, it's also exhilarating and free. And uh, I'm very disappointed with this. Um, we are looking at whether there are legal challenges we can make to it. And, and I believe that because I've been invited um, to a couple of local Latina meetings, Latina business, and they're getting very organized. You know, sometimes things take a while and um, they're having a, by the way, a Latina business expo this weekend <laughs> in Lopen High School yeah. at two o'clock. Um, I'm gonna be there. And, um, and some of, some of my, um, you know, some of my friends, we've helped spot, do a little sponsorship there for that, um, some of our Republican colleagues. So um, just to go out and see, I think people will really be surprised. And as many of them said, you know, many of these businesses, they're here, they're here legally, you know, they're contributing, um, you know, and, and they want a fair chance at this and they don't see this as an opportunity. The same with some of the, the newer, um, you know, Black businesses that are coming up. And I said, we don't want to, here you go, segregating out businesses and trying to, you're trying to pick winners and losers instead of letting the quality of their work, the opportunity to bid, make those choices. And this is, you're using the people's money. It should be for all the people to have the same opportunity. You know, Ruth, I think I've just come up with the idea for our March edition of the Delaware Times. We've been thinking about doing it on some aspect of uh, joint finance. Well, I think we're gonna talk about jobs in the economy and the public policies that are affecting Delaware's economy. I think it would be a great, great uh, topic for the next edition. So we'll probably be calling on you to write an opinion yeah. piece for that, doc, uh, for that edition. So plan on that, getting me something by the end of the first week of March. Uh, <laughs> okay. No worries. <laughs> <clears throat> no, because we, we usually print the second week, so. Well, we just did issue our last, uh, our February edition, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and I encourage everyone to look for it. If you have a, a business, put a few copies in there. Uh, if you are not, go to your hair salon, your nail salon, your Jiffy Lube, wherever you go, drop a few there. Your region chairs have multiple copies. Um, we distribute this by mail as well. Uh, we're getting subscriptions. People are writing in and for a $25 donation, you can actually subscribe. We'll mail it to your house for a whole year for 25 bucks. So it's a great, uh, great um, tool for us to get the word out about a lot of issues affecting people. So <clears throat> Ruth, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Is there anything I didn't cover that you really wanna- uh, One little thing I do wanna mention, cause I know a lot of folks online, I see some familiar names and faces are thinking all about the election next year. And we, when we heard from the um, commissioner of elections, they told us they've requested and the governor approved in his recommended budget, a full-time deputy attorney general to work in department of elections. And of course I said, why do we need somebody full-time? And they said, because of all these legal challenges. I, I figured why, but I wanted to know. And he said, there's frankly a lot of quest technical questions that come up and I'm just not prepared and I don't want to miss stuff. Um, they also talked about uh, we talked about making sure they fix the problems in Newcastle County and have enough more than enough ballots on hand. They talked a little bit about their um, the process for um, early, you know, for the early voting. And then um, they are really doing working now to find better locations, particularly in Sussex. We have some locations that were simply too small. We've outgrown them. And um, and I, I gave some suggestions for that. So um, you know, they're they're tooling up as I know we're tooling up as well and getting ready for the new way elections run in Delaware. Yep. And I encourage everybody, please, uh, if you're interested, attend our training on Wednesday night at the Colonial Region in People's Plaza or at Dave Wilson's Auction House on Thursday night at 630 to learn about how to push out there, um, chase and get them back and cure in case there are errors in how the person completes any absentee or, or mail-in ballot. So uh, we have school board elections coming up. Once again, if any of you are interested or you know someone who might be, please, please let us know. Uh, we still have a few candidate openings and we're actually unsure how many because it's taken a couple of weeks uh, for most of these background checks and uh, child abuse registry checks of the people who have filed for them to be posted. So the Department of Elections made the decision not to put the name up until they've determined the person is qualified after that review. And uh, it's taken a while. So we may be chasing a candidate 
in a district where we actually have someone who's filed and we don't know it, we've asked the Department of Elections to please let us know um, at least uh, where they have had filings and how many people have filed if they won't tell us who, but it seems just really stupid. We should be able to know. Uh, and I, I'm in a position um, where I'm about to advocate this, but we should know who's filed as soon as they file, whether they're qualified or not. Uh, we should be able to know that that person is interested in running for school board. And it keeps us from running around trying to find someone or fearing that we don't have a candidate when in fact someone that would be agreeable uh, in our perspective to the views we think are important, the priorities we think are important already has filed. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Representative. We My appreciate pleasure. you here. Uh, remember everyone uh, that this will um, is recorded. It will be posted on our website. If you know someone who couldn't make it today, have them come to our website and join us. And uh, it's been a pleasure. We will see you next week, 8 a.m. Take care.